Hello and welcome to Show and Tell with me, Stephen Leslie, the series where, shockingly, I show you some photos and then proceed to go and tell you all about them. Uh, this is episode seven, and today uh, we've got a slight change in the format because not only am I going to show you some great photos, but I've also got a special guest joining me here in the studio for the very first and possibly very last time. To introduce our guest star, that's what I'm here to do. So it really makes me happy to introduce to you. Although that's actually a lie, isn't it? Because this is in no way a studio and actually, I don't think I'm gonna do it in here. I think I'm probably gonna go into the kitchen and do it in there. So today I've got a very special kitchen guest joining me uh, to talk about the photos. And what are those photos, I hear you ask? Well, today we're gonna to be looking at photos of dogs. Dogs in street. And the person who's gonna be joining me today is Ben Burfitt, uh, who I consider to be one of the best dog photographers out there. Uh, he's also known as Axe of Dog, if you wanna go and look his stuff up. And he's responsible for so many images like this, like this, and even like this. So there you go, you lucky people. Let's do the titles and then get on with it. Now, when it comes to dogs in photography, the problem has never been finding any photographs. There's more dog photographs out there than there are fleas on real dogs. The problem is navigating our way through such a huge pack of images in order to sort the strays from the pedigrees. In fact, what I've ended up having to do is to split this episode into two parts. So right now I'm gonna try and do a quickish history of pooch photography. Then in part two, we'll haul Ben into the kitchen, sit him down, have a look at his stuff, and then we'll try and do a best in show dog photography competition, where Ben and I will attempt to judge some great dog images and award various trophies and rosettes in a number of different categories. So with that wildly ambitious lineup, uh, we better get cracking. The first point to note is that ever since the invention of the camera, people have been pointing them at dogs, which is only to be expected. Dogs are aesthetically very pleasing. And not only that, but people love trying to get dogs to do stuff. So getting your dog to sit or stay still or perform or dress up while you attempt to take their photo is right up there with trying to do the same thing to your newborn baby. Obviously really early on in the history of photography, the problem was that exposure times were so long you had to have a really good obedient dog to sit still in order to make sure that your photo turned out decent and wasn't all blurred. So this is Poodle with bow which apparently is the first recorded image of an animal on film. And it's from the early 1850s, where the exposure time would have been anywhere from three to 15 minutes, which would explain why the dog looks to be asleep or possibly even drugged, which was an old, or maybe that should be a new photographer's trick, and was also apparently deployed on fidgeting children, not just dogs. This early daguerreotype, or dog aerotype, sorry, sold at auction for over $8,000 in 2009. And here is another hand-coloured photo from approximately 1854 called Dog Sitting at Table. And I'd just like to imagine the photographer's assistant or the dog's owner just out of frame there with a large sausage, which they would have had to keep on dangling until the correct exposure time was reached. Or you end up with this sort of thing and nobody likes a dog with a blurred head. As I mentioned earlier, there's no shortage of these types of photos. Um, I've got this uh, Fiden book, which is just called Dogs. I think, and it's been compiled by a woman called Catherine Johnson. And in the blurb at the back, it describes her as one of the world's top collectors of photographs of dogs. I particularly like the way she's described as one of the world's top collectors of dog photos, because it makes me imagine there's a way of judging and ranking top dog photography collectors against each other, like in a dog show, and then giving them marks for how well groomed they are or how well organized their massive collection of dog photos are. Um, or maybe that's just me. Anyway, the main uh, takeaway from this book is that for as long as people have had cameras, they've enjoyed shoving their pet pooches in front of the lens. So this book is chock full of novelty shots of dogs in hats, dogs in boots, dogs with raccoons, a monkey riding on a dog, and even a couple of dogs sat up on the back of horses. As we'll come to see, it's the dog's tolerance for this kind of relentless, degrading human nonsense that makes them so central to photographic history. But I really don't want to dwell on the posed amateur shots for too long. What I really want to do is get onto some of the masters and start edging towards a history of dogs in street photography. 
Now, uh, you might remember that way back in the very first episode of Show and Tell, the one I did on bald men, uh, we looked at this photograph by uh, Jacques-Henri Lartigue. And this is of a man, Monsieur Follet, in his hat, apparently throwing his dog Tuppy across a river in 1912, which is very early indeed. I'm not claiming for a moment that it's street, and it's almost certainly a setup. Lartigue was fascinated by trying to capture action with his camera. As you can see, he was one of the very first people to successfully do this. And so this shot of Tuppy might indeed be the first action shot of a dog. But it's not street, is it? It could be river, I suppose. But for non-posed, non-action shots of dogs just being dogs, we have to wait uh, another couple of decades almost. Uh, but we stay in France and we turn to the work of another master, and that's André Curtez, who took both of these photographs in 1929 in Paris. Uh, and both, interestingly, are taken from high up in a building, which was a viewpoint and a photographic perspective that Cortez would continue to mine throughout his long career. So those two were both from 1929, and then here's one that he took nearly 40 years later in New York of a dog walker in 1967. And then another cracking one from up high in the 1970s of a bloke hauling his reluctant dog out into the snow. Cortez was ever watchful for this sort of thing. Here's a shot of him out on a balcony in the 1970s looking up, and another one of him on a different balcony looking down. And this is one of him towards the end of his life in 1982, as he ruefully scanned the horizon from inside, annoyed at missing out on another classic dog shot. Now, not many people know about the story I'm about to tell you, but uh, Cortez held a lifelong grudge against another titan of modern photography, and it was all over a dog photograph. Uh, so let me explain. Uh, everybody knows that in 1932, in Paris, Henri Cartier-Bresson took this photo behind the Gare Saint-Lazare, which is probably one of the most famous street photographs ever. The epitome of the decisive moment, rich with symbolism, the leaping man and the broken hoop in the foreground, possibly foretelling the coming turmoil in Europe, etc, etc, etc. But what few people realise is that in the same year, in the same town, 1932, in Paris, Henri Cartier-Bresson, co-founder of Magnum and famous humanist photographer, also took this image, which many photography scholars attest is the first ever dog sex street photo. And you know, it's a great decisive moment, isn't it? There's even a small audience of dogs watching the other dogs go at it. But why did this photo upset André Cortez so much? Well, legend has it that he was out with Henri Cartier-Bresson, or HCB as we'll call him, at the time, flaneuring about Paris, and Cortez spotted the randy dogs first, but then HCB pushed him out the way, he barged him to claim the shot for himself. Now I have no idea if that story is true, and unfortunately both parties involved are now dead, but the undisputable truth is that Henri Cartier-Bresson did say, in photography we all owe something to Cortez, and in his case, that thing was that he stole the earliest recorded dog sex street photo from Cortez, and no one else can ever wear that crown again, ever. And if you look at this photo, taken of the two great men years later in 1976, you can see the awkward body language between them. They're smiling, but facing away from each other. They'll always be separated by the memory of that first stolen dog sex street photo. It's also impossible to talk about dogs in street without mentioning the work of another master photographer, the great Elliot Erwitt. No one is more famous for their dog photos than Elliot Erwitt. And that's because like Cartier-Bresson, he got in there early to mark his territory. Now, no, he didn't barge poor Cortez out of the way, he didn't go that far, but what he did do was claim a certain style of dog photography as his very own forevermore. This is Chihuahua, New York City, 1946. So this classic photo was taken when Erwitt was just 18 years old, and he's been photographing dogs ever since. Erwitt, who by the way has always had a decent head of hair, is now 94, which means he's been taking dog photographs for 76 years, which is really quite extraordinary. He's taken photos of dogs in cars, people holding dogs. This one taken at a dog show in Birmingham in 1991 is probably one of the reasons why I got into street photography in the first place. I simply adore Elliot Erwitt's work, uh, which obviously uh, encompasses far more than just photographs of dogs, but uh, Dogs in Street is the subject of this episode, and so we're going to come back and focus in depth on that original Chihuahua photo. So there's a few things going on here. The first one is that he's engaging with the dog, who is looking straight at the camera and also happens to be wearing a knitted jumper. 
However, we can forgive Erwitt for this. He is not responsible for the Chihuahua's attire. This is just something he encountered. By the way, uh, that photo also predates and foreshadows another classic Elliot Erwitt dog street photo, which is this one, New York City Dog Legs, 1974, taken almost 30 years later and arguably even better. This Chihuahua is wearing a knitted coat and a knitted hat, and Erwitt's got the fantastic contrast not only of the human legs, but also a pair of Great Dane legs. This photo and the original Chihuahua photos have launched thousands of lesser imitations. Here's a couple of my own, which simply ape Erwitt's original idea, which he had way back in 1946, which was to come down to the dog's level and put the camera on the ground. Totally the opposite to Curtez's passion for being up high and looking down. Erwitt struck gold by dropping to his knees, or as you can see here in this photo, taken in the 1990s, sitting cross-legged on the floor when those famous knees started to get a bit creaky. But this is what the top photographers are prepared to do to get a result. And what a result that Chihuahua photo turned out to be. Because today, if you want an official big signed print of it, right now from Magnum, it will set you back a whopping 34,000 quid. But the other interesting thing about that photo is that because it's become so successful and so iconic, uh, the contact sheet from that day has leaked out onto the internet and so you can find it and it makes for absolutely fascinating viewing. First of all, we can see how Erwitt worked the scene. You can read this roll of film like a little storyboard. It starts off as a candid street shot. Erwitt spotted these two women chatting on a corner, noticed the tiny dog and took his first shot. And it's not bad, but the thing that made him great even then was that he hung about and ended up shooting a whole roll of medium format. He thought this one with the dog's tongue out could also be a keeper but then he's also done a more posed portrait up here and then he's gone down onto the pavement or the sidewalk as I believe Americans call it and obviously he's shooting with a twin lens reflex camera so that would definitely help with his framing but let's note a few extra details first he took six shots while he was down there and it seems like he nailed it the first time but then he carried on because when it comes to dog photos they tend to move about a hell of a lot and you never really know whether you've got the little buggers or not especially on medium format second the shot is a bit of a setup He's obviously asked the owner to put the dog down for him, and I'd almost bet she didn't appreciate that he's going to include her feet in the frame for humour and scale. But you can see her hand up here trying to get the tiny dog to sit or be still. Finally, the other insight this contact sheet gives us is that this famous shot is a massive crop. Even aged 18, Erwitt had absolutely no problem with jettisoning a huge chunk of the frame as he could see it was superfluous. It adds nothing to the picture. It's all there in that tiny rectangle, which then makes it look as if it was shot on 35 millimeter. Except of course, if it had been shot on 35 millimeter, I doubt it would have been so forgiving under the enlarger. Whenever I'm teaching workshops, I inevitably get asked if cropping is okay. People seem to think that for some reason, cropping is akin to cheating. It's not. What I always say, and I always reference this shot, is if something will benefit from a crop, then crop, it's not cheating. Cropping is great, crop especially if it then results in a timeless shot of a chihuahua in a jumper worth $30,000. Crap! What's also worth considering is how some incredibly influential photographers clearly could not give a monkey's toss about dog photographs. In the whole of Robert Frank's The Americans, which is arguably the most important street photography book of all time, and a touchstone of American identity, there is not one single image of a dog. Not one. Not even in the background, not even a tiny chihuahua in a knitted jumper exiting frame left. I think this is quite extraordinary when you consider it, especially as the Americans is meant to be a survey of American life at the time. And so to exclude dogs from the 83 images chosen for the book seems almost a deliberate snub. In Jack Kerouac's funky beat preface, he writes that Frank captures the humor, the sadness, the everythingness of America in capital letters. Which is all very well, except in this case, the everythingness excludes dogs. In the whole book, the closest we get to a dog photo is this, which many critics have interpreted as a sly joke on Frank's behalf. It's as if he's saying, okay, yes, I'll acknowledge that dogs do exist. Here's a sign referencing them. But of course, it's actually a sign about a sausage, a food much beloved of dogs. And what's another name for a hot dog? A Frankfurter. And what do they also call Frankfurters in New York? That's right, Franks. So is Robert Frank saying that he's the only dog he's going to allow in the Americans? Not just a hot dog, but the top dog? Maybe, to be honest, I haven't got a clue.
What I do know is that for more than 50 years after its publication, both photography scholars and dog lovers alike have protested the absence and lack of dogs in the Americans, and slowly a project was started to try and right this terrible wrong. It started subtly when Richard Avenden took a dog along with him to take Frank's portrait in 1975. But even after this fluffy icebreaker, it wasn't until 2014, when Frank was 90 years old, that he gave permission to Peter Galassi, a former chief curator of photography at the Museum of Modern Art, to begin going through the 27,000 shots that Frank took while crisscrossing across America shooting the Americans. Galassi's brief was simple but challenging. Just find a dog, any dog. So finally, after his forensic forage through Frank's Forgotten Frames, uh, Peter Galassi published this book in 2014, which is called uh, In America, and expands the original 83 photographs to 131, and contains, drumroll please, just one image of a dog. That's right, just one solitary image, and it's a blink and you'll miss it shot of a tiny dog although I doubt it's a chihuahua in a jumper, out on the porch of this house near McGee, Arkansas, taken in 1955, and that's it. The only dog photograph snapped by Robert Frank in America. Pathetic. But Frank was a bit of an anomaly among street photographers because the real situation I've been faced with when doing this is that virtually anyone you can think of has at least one decent dog photo in their portfolio. Uh, now, I mentioned right at the start of this episode that what I'm planning on doing is to split this consideration, this, this, this film, into two separate parts. Uh, so this has been a brief history, and then I'm going to haul Ben in, Ben Bertha in for uh, part two, and we're going to do a kind of judging or best in show of the greatest, or some of the greatest, uh, dog street photographs ever taken. Uh, but before I get on to that, I just want to end this with a brief consideration about someone, uh, another photographer, who takes the most fantastic dog photographs. Uh, in Russia, in his native Finland, in India, all across Europe. Um, and he's called Penti Shamalathi. I hope I've got that right. Um, who, none of these photographs are staged, by the way, even though some of them, this one in particular, looks almost like a composite, but it isn't. Um, Shamalathi does admit to carrying treats around with him, Always in my camera bag there is something for the animals. Ah, seeds for seeds the, for the small, birds. small birds and mm -hmm. sausage for the, for the sausage. dogs. Oh, dogs love sausage. And here's a great photo showing a naughty dog attempting to steal Shamalathi's special sausage sack full of meaty treats. Penty apparently took this one while running backwards, then tripped and fractured his coccyx, but at least he got the shot. So I just want to end on a few of his photographs, uh, primarily because they're great, but also because most people who know about his images know them for their lyrical or poetic qualities. He does all his own printing and his expert ability with composition and harnessing the different tones of snow is truly astonishing. But the real reason that I like him is in addition to all these beautiful, lyrical, poetic photographs that he's made, uh, he also took this one, which is just pure, unadulterated filth. This is probably the doggiest dog photo ever taken, which manages to be simultaneously shocking, funny, explicit, just everything all at once, and goes a considerable way to capturing what life for a dog is like, all in a single shot. It really is tremendous, but it also still retains a kind of aesthetic decorum to it, just by being taken on film and in slightly muted black and white and grey tones. Um, and that's as good a place as any to stop, really, because when we come back uh, in part two, you're going to meet Ben Burfitt, uh, and his photos are sort of like a modern day update of that uh, classic Penti Shamalathi photo, uh, but it's set in bright, you know, sort of screaming colours with uh, fur and slobber and tails and fangs flying everywhere. I mean, they really are fantastic uh, and they make a great contrast. So um, I promise you part two will be out very, very soon. I've just got a few things to do in my life first. Uh, and then, yeah, so, so we'll put it up. So please stay tuned. Uh, thanks to everyone who subscribed. Um, I've been Stephen Leslie. This has been Show and Tell and see you soon. Woof.